The Beast from the East came out in April of 1988 and was the first live album for the heavy metal band Dokken, their fifth album overall. Recorded in Japan during their tour of their fourth album, Back for the Attack, the album includes an, a new original track called Walk Away, which might be the most generic hair metal song of its era, and uh... Wait... No, no, this isn't right. Hang, hang on, let me start over. <clears throat> the Beast from the East is the nickname of former Russian professional boxer Nikolai Valyu. Debuting in the sport in 1993 and having a 46-match winning streak up till 2007, Nikolai was a two-time WBA World Heavyweight Champion and the tallest man to hold that title at 7 feet. He retired in 2009 after a majority decision loss to David Hay, where he then entered the political arena and became a member of... Uh... Oh, no, st still wrong. Okay, okay, one more time. <clears throat> The Beast from the East is the dumbest Goosebumps book I've covered so far. There, that's more like it. It's finally happened. Every time I've had one of my annual Goosebumps polls, there's been a small but dedicated group of people voting for this book, and now its day has finally come. The Beast from the East is finally upon us. Now, I'm excited for next year, because I ain't got any idea what's going to happen. Hey, fun fact, this was the last Goosebumps book published before Animorph started. Enjoy being Scholastic's golden boy while you can, Stein! So allow me to introduce our characters. Our narrator this evening is Ginger Wald, a 12-year-old girl who was traumatized at a young age from a fear of bedbugs and the teddy bear's picnic, which admittedly are both kind of horrible. On one side you have the threat of insects that will eat you while you sleep, and on the other you have a forest full of bears attached with the vague threat of you better go in disguise. Then there are her 10-year-old twin brothers, Pat and uh, Nat. I, I hate cute twin names. Anyway, they're annoying. Nat likes to climb trees, and Pat has a Game Boy. That's it. That's all the character you'll get from them, and the Game Boy thing doesn't even have a payoff. These three kids and their parents are out hiking in the woods, looking for a camping spot, being generally miserable as people who don't want to camp, but camp because they feel it might broaden their character or something, are want to do. Oh, that brings back memories of being ten, wandering around rocky terrain with nothing to do, slipping and falling directly onto a cactus. Yeah, my character was totally broadened. I learned so many new curse words. Pat and Nat are brats. Ha! So Dad tells Ginger to take care of them. Take them into the woods, Dad instructed me. Try to lose them, okay? What do you mean by lose them? Well, have you ever seen the film The Good Son? Take them into the woods and lose them? That sounds like a line from The Sopranos. So Ginger takes Pat and Nat out into the woods for a game of hide-and-seek, which lasts for all of two minutes, but when they make their way back to the campsite, they quickly find themselves lost. I thought you knew the way, Pat complained. Didn't they teach you anything at that nature camp? Nature camp. Last summer, my parents forced me to spend two weeks at an Explore the Great Outdoors camp. I got poison ivy the first day. After that, I didn't listen to anything the counselors said. Now I wish I had. This bit about Ginger's stint in a nature camp seems like an important setup. They even bothered to mention it on the summary in the back cover, but I'm going to tell you right now, there's no payoff to this. At no point does Ginger suddenly remember something from camp that solves a problem. She doesn't identify an edible plant or fool somebody with a bird collar or, or even use moss on a tree to find Norf. That, that would have been a, a perfectly on-topic thing, since these characters will need to be keeping track of their compass directions here shortly. Throw that in with the Game Boy and the wasting my time pile. So the kids wander around a bit, getting more lost and more desperate, and then Ginger gets her shoes wet and everyone starts laughing until Pat reveals he kicked that fucking map into the creek yesterday, and I'm sorry, I'm so sorry! 
Oh, Blair Witch joke in 2014. Yes, I did. No, in actuality, the more lost these kids get, the more Willy Wonka-ish the woods get, with the rust-colored grass and giant purple cabbage plants and jungle vines and multicolored trees with branches going off in perfect right angles like if Dr. Zeus had OCD. Just when you thought it couldn't get any stranger, the beasts finally show up. All three of us gasped as a tall beast stomped through the trees. It was huge, so tall that its head touched the middle branches. It had a narrow, pointy head over a long neck. Its eyes shone like bright green marbles. Shaggy blue fur covered every part of its body. Its long, furry tail thumped heavily on the ground. The beast opened its mouth. Two rows of sharp yellow teeth rose up from purple gums. One long, jagged fang slipped down over the creature's chin. The beast spun around in circles. It sniffed the air and wiggled its hairy, pointed ears. Wow, that's... That looks nothing like the monster on the cover art. No pointy head, no long neck, parts of its body without fur. Uh, there's no tail, no single long fang, no pointy ears. It's hard to get a size perspective, since this is a fictional monster on fictional plants, but you don't get the impression that it's particularly larger than a person. How this happened is beyond me. Maybe Tim Jacobus got the wrong brief? With that bit at the beginning where Ginger talks about how she's scared of teddy bears for a while, Tim probably thought this was going to be a book about evil teddy bear monsters and design the monster accordingly? Or maybe there's something a, a bit more personal going on here. Damn it, Stein! You said the monster was an evil blue teddy bear, so I drew an evil blue teddy bear. Why'd you go and change it on me, huh? You know damn well why, Tim. I saw what you did with the abominable snowman of Pasadena. What are you talking about? You put a nipple on it. You put a goddamn meaty nipple on the abominable snowman. I didn't want that happening again, but I guess I didn't change the brief in time because looky here, the beast from the east with a goddamn meaty nipple. What is wrong with you? Well, it's not like I can put meaty nipples on ten-year-old kids, can I? I gotta put them on where I can. No, you ain't gotta put them in anywhere. Ah! Ah! Oh, man, the fantasy world in my head is so much fun. So the creature, which I must remind you that despite my using this image as a reference picture, is not a blue teddy bear with nipples. It leaves, then comes back with a whole pack of creatures, and then they leave. Thinking the coast is clear, Pat gets the bright idea of splitting up, running into the forest on his own. Before Ginger and Nat can give chase, the beasts finally return, spotting the kids. One of them approaches Ginger, slaps her shoulder, and in perfect English, declares her it. She is now the Beast from the East. Because the title doesn't actually refer to the monsters themselves, but to the game they are playing. Of course, Ginger doesn't know the rules, so the beasts give them some basics. In order to tag someone in, you have to tag them from the East. The game ends when the sun sets, and whoever is the Beast at that time gets eaten. Hold on, I protested. What if we don't want to play? Yeah, why should we? Nat demanded. You have to play, Flag replied. Read that sign over there. He pointed to a cardboard sign tacked to one of the gourd trees. The sign read, Game in Season. Seems legit. Would totally hold up in court. Now, I've seen this book described by a few people as Evil Calvin Ball, but I don't find that entirely accurate. If you're not familiar, Calvin Ball is a Democratic Council member of the 2nd District of Howard County, Maryland, the youngest person to ever lead the county council, and oh my god, there's actually a real-life person named Calvin Ball. How awesome is that? Uh, sorry, no. Actually, Calvin Ball is a sport introduced in the comic strip Calvin and Hobbes, a.k.a. the greatest thing the universe has ever produced. Playing between a young boy and his imaginary tiger, the defining characteristic of Calvin Ball is constantly changing rules. The Beast from the East has set rules that never change. The human characters and the readers don't know or understand all of the rules, but it's not like someone goes, Ha, now you have to tag people from the West, or Ha, now you have to hop on one foot, or die, or Ha, now we're just doing a revival of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Sure, the rules seem weird and convoluted to us, but 
You know what? Cricket seems weird and convoluted to me, and I don't call it British Calvin Ball. So Ginger and Nat run into the forest, unsure how to play or where Pat is, or if they can even find their way back to their parents. They run through some vines, but surprise! The vines are actually snakes and wrap themselves around the kids. One of the creatures, Fleg, shows up and saves them by tickling the snakes. There's like nine different ways to write a dick joke there. Fleg congratulates them because getting attacked by snakes earns the kids points. What are the points used for? Fuck if I know. I'm not even going to try and understand evil cricket here. This tickling snake business is one of the two times that anything set up actually has a payoff. The other being Nat's ability to climb trees. In fact, they are both paid off in the same scene. Nat climbs a tree to get a lay of the land and maybe spot a creature for Ginger to tag in so that she's not you know, the beast from the east anymore, but the tree comes to life and tries to strangle the kid. I had a crazy idea, but maybe, just maybe it would work. If the tree is alive, maybe it has feelings, I thought, and if it has feelings, maybe it's ticklish, just as the snakes were. Seems legit. Ginger tickles the tree until it lets Nat go, and thankfully this is the last time anything is tickled. I was worried that Ginger might just start tickling everything in sight, screaming, Am I winning? Am I winning the game? Instead, Nat touches a boulder and it explodes. It turns out to be a penalty rock, and when you touch it, you get put in a cage and are eaten along with the beast from the east. The creatures steal away Nat, and Ginger is now on her own. All right, so we're about halfway through this book, and I think it's time I address my big issue with what makes this the worst Goosebumps book I've covered in this series thus far. Put simply, this book has nothing driving it. Oh, sure, the characters are driven by survival, but these are just set pieces. Something happens, Ginger goes, ah, and gets out of it, move on to the next set piece. We never actually reflect on anything, nothing is really sought and none of it means anything. Each set piece feels disposable. They can be shuffled and removed fairly randomly, and the book would still feel largely intact. In the three Goosebumps books we've covered thus far, Welcome to the Dead House, The Haunted Mask, and The Haunted School, each of them were driven by one of two things, mystery or message. In Dead House and Haunted School, there's the mystery of what is haunting these places, what exactly is the nature and origin of these spooks, and what can be done about them. The set pieces in these books draw the characters, and by extension the reader, further into these mysteries. The Beast from the East isn't interested in solving mysteries at all. There's no attempt to even speculate as to the nature of this place. Is it part of our normal world? Is it another dimensions that the characters slip into, like Narnia? What are the creatures exactly? Why do they speak perfect English, and why do they have access to cardboard? Why do they play death games? Why are they not curious about human beings? Do humans come around here a lot? Is the whole game just a malicious scheme to trap humans for food? It's not like I need answers to all of these questions, but it'd sure be nice if the characters even bothered to ask them, you know? Make me think they were the least bit invested in what's going on around them. I've already expressed how this book has a knack of setting things up to provide no payoff, like Ginger's wilderness training. There are so many details about this world that are just begging to be followed up on, investigated, and explained. For example, there is a creature the kids run into a few times named Spork, because Arlstein puts the first thing he thinks of onto the page. Spork is a bit different from the other creatures. He's more roughed up and he's missing an eye. His attitude seems to change depending on who he's around, and during a life and death game of the Beast from the East, he's tasked with babysitting younger creatures. This is a character that clearly has a history, and I was practically begging the book to throw in some kind of backstory or motivation, even a vague one, something to give this place history or any semblance of meaning, but... No, we learn nothing about Spork. Another detail the book cannot be bothered to follow up on. But, you know what, that's okay. There's more than one way to tell a story, and the nonsense going on can be justified if you go the other route I mentioned. Message. The Haunted Mask was a message book, which actually, when I put it that way, makes it sound like it was a book about staying away from drugs or something. I mean, it was a book driven by themes. It wasn't really interested in the backstory of its titular artifact, because that wasn't really the point. 
the point of that book was that of a bullied girl trying to bully the bullies back and facing severe consequences from it. The mask is not just an evil magical item, but a metaphor of how acting like a monster makes you a monster. It seems to me that Arl Stein is heavily influenced by the Twilight Zone and its use of horror and fantasy elements to reflect the human condition through metaphor, which is not to compare Stein to Ron Sterling. God knows we don't want to do that. But as you probably guessed by now, The Beast from the East doesn't have any themes, any metaphors, any messages to get across. And it's not like it would be hard to do it. There's a lot of interesting ways we can implement games in real life. Well, we could have a character who plays video games all the time, with the people around her going, you need to stop playing video games and enjoy the real world. And then the game becomes the real world. Ooh, spooky. Actually, that was really fucking lame. Sorry, let me try another one. What if the book opened with some kids, a, a bunch of close friends, playing a game, and this new younger kid comes up and wants to play too? So the older kids let him play, but they don't tell him all the rules so that he can never win. I imagine this is a common enough occurrence. I know I've been on both sides of this conflict, uh, regrettably. Bullies facing karmic justice. It's one of the oldest tricks in the book, but the Beast from the East has nothing at its core. Ginger and her brothers didn't bring this on themselves. It's just stuff happening. Stuff that has no justification for existing. All right, moving on. Ginger is on her own now. She tries tagging a creature, but winds up falling into a pit, which happens to be a patch of green, designating it as a free lunch space where anyone caught on it gets eaten. Shit, what doesn't get you eaten in this game? Ginger gets out of it when a uh, cloud moves over her head, meaning she's made in the shade, basically a temporary safe zone. Ginger then tries to tag Spork, but... You tagged me from the west, Spork whispered. It doesn't count. I could feel the blood rush to my face. No fair! I tagged you! I tagged you! I wailed. Spork shrugged. You have to tag me from the east, remember? Spork's little eyes nearly disappeared as his face crumpled in laughter. You're still the beast from the east. You know, it's a special kind of protagonist to forget the name of the game, her present role in the game, and the name of the book all at the same time. However, Ginger does manage to get one over Spork when she gets him involved in a new game of spinning around a bunch and being the last person standing, which Spork falls for because, while they have an advantage in knowing all the obscure rules, the creatures are basically idiots. While Spork is dizzy, Ginger tags him again, this time from the east, and now Ginger just has to play keep away until sunset. After that, only her brother will be murdered. Partial victory! While running through the forest, Ginger stumbles into Pat, who has no idea what's going on and is fairly shocked when introduced to the creatures. The creatures chase them around for a bit until... The bushes parted and a strange creature bounced out. I had never seen anything like it. It had the body of a dog, as big as a German shepherd, and the face of a squirrel. I don't believe this, I thought. It could talk, too. In here, quick! The creature urged in a scratchy, squeaky voice. Its squirrel nose twitched, its bushy tail thrashed from side to side. Could we trust it? In here! It squeaked. It waved a paw in the air, pointed to a bush of big orange leaves. Pat held back, but I crept forward. I spotted the entrance to a cave hidden behind the leaves. Seems legit! So Ginger and Pat hide in this cave, only for it to be full of bugs. Ew, gross, I guess. This turns out to be an official hiding cave, a one-use-only official hiding spot, which sounds like a horrible thing to include in a game. All right, guys. Remember, there are six designated hiding caves, and you can only use one once. Um, Glorp, isn't a hiding cave that everyone knows about kind of antithetical to hiding? I don't know about you, but if I was trying to find someone, I'd probably check the hiding caves first. Just saying. Yes, Nugog, but because you questioned the hiding cave, you lose ten points and you are to be eaten. Uh, again? So Ginger and Pat use up their hiding cave time, and... Uh, no, I don't know what the deal was with the squirrel dog. They don't explain it. And they run, 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 until finally the sun sets. 
Ginger thinks she's safe, but like the children playing games on the playground metaphor that this book doesn't bother to use, Spork runs up, tags Ginger, and then the game is officially declared over. Ginger is to be eaten, along with Pat, since he was her helper. You know, by that logic, everyone seems to have been helping Spork out, so if Ginger had won, she'd have had to eaten the entire goddamn clan. And you're not leaving this table until you've eaten every bite. So they escort the two kids back to camp and start prepping the ovens when Nat shows up, having escaped his cage. You doubled, Spork said to Pat. You did a classic crone. I stared at the beasts, studied their strange expressions. Hadn't they seen twins before? You doubled yourself, Flag declared. That's a classic crone. Why didn't you tell us? Um, tell you what? I asked. Flag glared at me. Why didn't you tell us that you are level three players? I'm sure there's a message here about how this could have all been avoided if everyone had stayed together when lost, but a blatant moral at the end of this book would have been too nuanced for Stein, I think. So the creatures allowed Ginger and the twins to leave, out into the forest with killer trees and aggressive snakes and pit traps and exploding boulders. I'm sure they're going to be fine. Until they run into another level three creature who promptly tags Ginger in. The twist ending! Dum dum dum. Whatever. Follow up. I think I've adequately expressed my dislike for this book. It's not that it's got weird random things in it. I enjoy weird random things as much as the next person, but it has nothing to give the story any weight. Things like character arcs, themes, intrigue, pacing, and payoff have all decided to sleep in today, leaving us with just a few weird images and a low ache of confusion. This has more value as a deviant art account than it does a book. I just... I don't want to make you feel bad, but why the cult following? What do people get out of this? At least Welcome to Dead House had a realized threat to the characters. At least the Haunted Mask had something to say. At least the Haunted School had mystery. This book doesn't have anything. There are no calories here. Just a 118 pages of, and then this happened. I, I know everyone hates South Park right now, but if I can evoke them for a moment... There was this lecture that Matt Stone and Trey Parker did where they laid out their writing process when outlining their stories. They make sure that each beat of the story is joined by therefore or but. Character A gets a lot of money, therefore he holds a party to celebrate, but character B wasn't invited, therefore character B's feelings are hurt. It's a simple tool to map out causation, to create a flow to the story. There are very few Therefores and buts in the Beast from the East. Kid gets lost in the woods, and then they run into some monsters, and then they get caught up in a game, and it goes on and on like that. This book has no flow. It's just... Its images suggest fun, but the book is farthest from fun. It's just... Blah! I give The Beast from the East... The Beast from the East out of ten.